Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, now and in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And Amen. just like that, Mary has appeared. Mary, good to see you. We were just Hi. Talking. How are you doing? We were just talking about you. Well, actually, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Um, I I've had my last chemo, and as you go along, the side effects get more difficult and they last longer. So, um, in a few days, I I feel like I've had a glimpse of of functioning rather normally, and then and then something happens. And but I'm familiar with all this, so I don't get worried about it. I say, okay, just a boo. You know, we'll wait till tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, I'm here. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Well, everyone, we are picking back up um, Acts of the Apostles. We started that two weeks ago. And I am just going to turn on the panoramic view in person here. And I'll put it in the, I'll change the name in a second. We've got myself and Barb and Diane and Charity. And um, just down the hall, our new parish administrator, Lauren, started this week, too. So she's getting up. She's man in the fort down there. And I prayed the first, the collect I prayed is the first collect of the Sunday of Advent. For, oh, wait, let's try that again. The collect for the first Sunday of Advent. So if you worshiped with us this weekend, in some form, you would have heard that prayer. One of my all-time favorite prayers. One of the best written prayers in the prayer book. Cast, us, cast away the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. And I just wanted to just pause there and just give you a little quick little Episcopal 101 about the prayers in the prayer book that are assigned for each Sunday are called collects. And it literally just means collect the prayers together, which is why usually the person praying the prayer has their hands in this form, which is kind of uh, like a, almost like we're, we're gathering up all the prayers in the room and then kind of and kind of pushing them up to God a little bit. So that's whenever my hands are in this position, that's what's going on there. And in a Eucharist, the collect of the day is, comes up first. It's one of the early things in the service, and it kind of sets a tone for the day ahead, for the, the theme of the worship. And sometimes it pulls from our readings, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, or sometimes it kind of, the collect is co um, commenting on the, the seasons or the seasonal change. And so this one is very mindful of um, the time of year. Um, funny enough, Advent always happens the same time of year, right? <laughs> Who knew? It's always the end of November, early December. And so you have this kind of play on a reality, which is that it's getting darker out there. And so they use this old kind of Christus Victor medieval talk of Jesus, the more triumphant warrior uh, king, destroying evil um you know this makes great for great hymns and all so that's where you get this language where they kind of take a a battle imagery and then they basically invert it because we know that jesus is the is truly the inverse of, of fighting and violence and all so it's instead you kind of re, it's like, just like what the cross is in many ways you know a symbol of one thing mm -hmm. kind of transformed to mean something different so Give us the grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So you see that with the what the words are doing there a little bit. Instead of putting on the armor to fight, you put on armor of light, like the light of Christ. And it's just such a great um, setup. The four prayers for each Sunday of Advent are really beautiful prayers. And clergy really especially love the third Sunday of Advent. So I'm going to give you a little watch, watch for me to try, to try not to crack up when I pray it in two weeks. Because the third Sunday is always the one that we think of as the, um, you know, making Christmas cookie kind of Sunday. Because the, the very first phrase is, stir up your power, O Lord. <laughs> it's like stirring, stirring the batter. You know? There you go. All right. But we are back on Acts. And I, I don't remember exactly where we left off. If somebody knows, let me know. But I, I know it was in the middle of chapter two. And I think... Did we leave off before Peter stood and started speaking or after? Do you know, Leslie? 14. We're at 14. 14. Okay, that sounds right. Yeah. Right. So um, by way of reminder, and for those that weren't there, real quick, um, Acts, we believe, is written by the same author that wrote Luke's gospel. So together, Luke and Acts. Um, Sorry, could you say that again? 
No, I, I said uh, <laughs> Luke is written by uh, Acts is written by Luke. In the way it's presented to us in the Bible, there John is in between them, which is a little inconvenient. And actually, it would it would serve us better if Luke flew right into Acts, um, because the beginning of Acts and the beginning of Luke are really identical. The beginning of Luke. Um, begins almost like a letter, like a little preface, like a dedication, like you'd find in a novel, and basically says to you, dear Theophilus, you know, I wanted to set an orderly account of all of the things about Jesus, the Son of God, and, and the important things being that name Theophilus, which means lover of God, which means it could be a real person named Theophilus, just like Theodore, or it could be an imaginary person. It could be a um, kind of a metaphor for the reader that anyone who receives Luke's gospel is a lover of God. And I kind of tend to like that one true too. Um, and then now we get into um, Acts and it's part two. And um, in Luke's mind, it's part two. So he begins the same way in chapter one with, uh, remember Theophilus, the first one I wrote? We had some good times. Jesus you know, conquered death and then ascended. And here's where we left off. And basically we get Jesus for the first nine verses or so. And then we see his ascension again, almost from a different angle, um, very cinematic in many ways. And then, and then you suddenly have two angels appear just like they did at the end of Luke's gospel in the tomb. Two angels appearing to say some kind of context as to what's going on. And again, what happens when angels show up in the Bible? Everyone's afraid. So um, first the angels say, don't be afraid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then they go on to say, um, and we're in this instance on the hill, Jesus is not basically not coming back. And, you know, why would you stand and look to heaven? So um, the disciples kind of agree. What a great idea. Maybe we should get do some work here. And then what we what we did last time in chapter one and the very first thing they do is to try to recreate the, the 12, because at this point in time, there's only 11 because Judas has killed himself. Uh, and I don't know if Judas would have been welcomed back with open arms anyway, if he, if he had been alive, he'd probably, be, um, probably not be welcome. So uh, because the 12 disciples is a kind of an echo, at least scripturally, um, we don't know if this was ex exactly what we were in, they were intending um, or what Jesus was intending. But the 12 disciples can kind of be thought of as, as marrying with the idea of the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, and therefore, that's kind of the impetus is why we got to get to 12. We got to get to that number because that's kind of a perfect number. Um, and also, it's kind of um, it's, it's restoration. It's justice in many ways. It's kind of saying we realize what Judas did was horrible, but um, if we can replace him with somebody, you know, quote unquote, good hearted, then um, maybe this can be the start of something new. We can turn the page a little bit. And, and plus with 12 will be um, an even stronger unit to start whatever it is this movement is going to become. So they cast lots, they roll dice, and um, that's how they get Matthias. So Matthias becomes the first, I think we might say the first apostle, which is a, probably the best way to explain it. I'm simplifying this, is that you have the disciples who were physically in Jesus's presence, and then you have an apostle, which could be a disciple, or it is more likely referring to somebody that um, didn't have one-on-one didn't have -on -one, um, encounters with Jesus, but somebody that kind of serves in a capacity like a disciple too. Paul will call himself an apostle, and it'll become a source of tension between the disciples and him. Okay, after that, they gather in the upper room, and it should be, it's supposed to be the same room where they had the Last Supper, um, and it's an upper level. That's why we call it the upper room. So there's people on the streets, there's a market down below, and everyone hears them all of a sudden being overcome by the, the, um, the Holy Spirit, and speaking in tongues, and we talked a bit about how this is a, a, a really beautiful reversal of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, where people try to build a tower to God, and then God scrambles the languages so that they can't communicate. Uh, here, it's reversed in many ways. They are speaking in tongues, but as David rightly pointed out, it's not gibberish, as we often think of speaking in tongues. They are actually speaking in tongues of the languages of the world. 
And in a really beautiful way, it's as if they're being prepared by the spirit for uh, an outward focused ministry where now they can go communicate to all the many lands and evangelize, basically try to get new, um, new followers of Christ. And this sets up the, one of the major themes and will be a source of tension throughout Acts of the Apostles and possibly throughout history of Christianity. Uh, is this a religion for Jews? Or is this a religion for all people, Jew and Gentile? And Paul and Peter are going to have some um, differing um, opinions on this. Uh, so that's where we left off. So now they've been speaking in tongues. Everyone on the street thinks they're drunk. In verse 13, they jeer and say they're full of new wine. Mm -hmm. And now we're on verse 14. And let me, before I read in, is there any questions or anything people wanted to clarify or clean up in any way all right here we go verse 14 and i'm reading from the common english bible peter stood with the other 11 apostles he raised his voice and declared judeans and everyone living in jerusalem know this listen carefully to my words these people aren't drunk as you suspect after all it's only nine o'clock in the morning <laughs> Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man whose credentials God proved to you through miracles. Times. Through him among you, you yourselves know this. In accordance with God's established plan and foreknowledge, he was betrayed. You, with the help of wicked men, had Jesus killed by nailing him to a cross. God raised him up. God freed him from death's dreadful grip, since it was impossible for death to hang on to him. David says this about him. I foresaw that the Lord was always with me, because he is at my right hand and I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my body will live in hope, because you won't abandon me to the grave, nor permit your Holy One to experience decay. You have shown me the paths of life. Your presence will fill me with happiness. And there, he's, when he says David, he's referring to King David, who is traditionally considered the author of the Psalms, and that's probably not realistically what's happened. That's just a tradition. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, I can speak confidently about the patriarch David. He died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this very day. Because he was a prophet, he knew that God promised him with a solemn pledge to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Having seen this beforehand, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he wasn't abandoned to the grave, nor did his body experience decay. This Jesus God raised up. We are all witnesses to that fact. He was exalted to God's right side and received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He poured out this Spirit, and you are seeing and hearing the results of his having done so. David didn't ascend into heaven, yet he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right side until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. They said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. With many other words, he testified to them and encouraged them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. 
God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. So for those of us who walk through uh, Leviticus, <coughs> welcome change in storytelling, right? One of the reasons I love Luke so much, both his gospel and Acts, is this is we're in the hands of a really, really gifted writer and a really intelligent writer who knows how to tell a story. And it's, he's doing so well. Hey, thank you, thank you. And um, stars of hope will be downstairs. Oh, perfect, thank you. And um, part of what Luke is doing here, you know, this is again, don't be concerned about it too much, but Luke is, um, some of this is Luke and some of this might have, might have been actually Peter. And you probably want to skew on the side of saying more of this is Luke, you know, kind of using Peter as a character to say some of the points that Luke is trying to make. But that's okay because Luke has about 60 years of tradition since the death of Jesus to have had to interpret all of this. So, and, you know, it's a, it's a lot like, again, I'm a broken record about it, but it's, it's about how a movie deals with somebody's, a story of somebody's life and how they have to make some changes. And that sometimes the filmmaker has a point of view um, about someone's life that comes through in the film. So here we have Peter, um, you know, I don't know, for example, that Peter had all of this scripture committed to memory, but maybe he did um, because again, we think he was illiterate but he probably attended worship a lot and maybe had some of the stuff committed to memory. Um, but it, it also doesn't say he's looking at a scratch piece of paper here. And he's basically preaching to them. He's interpreting scripture. He's interpreting two, two things, a psalm and a prophet, and trying to, um, for the first time, at least in the New Testament, except for Paul's writing, he is, um, Luke here is having um, Peter uh, basically give you a bit of a theology about Christ that includes the fact that this, all of this was somehow promised or foretold in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is always something that's like a fine line you want to walk because you don't ever want to say the Old Testament writers knew exactly what was going to happen or Jesus, but in many ways it's, it's more that we take what happened with Jesus and then kind of retrofitted it into oh, okay, this is what Isaiah was saying, Emmanuel with us, you know, and that's how we get part of the Christmas narrative and all. I hope that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. What um, what other things stuck out to you or things you had questions about? Uh, I might be confused, which uh -huh. could happen. So when he talks about that, that they should be baptized, are you saying that the uh, disciples were not baptized when Jesus, when they were with Jesus Christ? Yeah, I think that's, I, this has come up before. I don't think we have any story or anything written down that talks about the disciples being baptized themselves. Um, never, never talks about Jesus baptizing anyone. Yeah, we don't. And, I, and, I, and I'm not sure if we should assume that they did and it just wasn't written down. But if they did and they didn't write it down, then that meant somebody didn't think it was important. So uh, it's a good, it's a really good question, Barb. But However, Jesus's words to them in two gospels and repeated here um, through, through Peter's speech is to basically say, in order to uh, be forgiven for your sins, in order to you know, be made, restored to God, made whole again, you need to be baptized, mm -hmm. you know, basically to be, and, and then this is kind of the origins of where we come up with it as a kind of an, init, an initiation into Christianity. Mm -hmm. If you want to be one of us, Mm -hmm. properly get baptized and it works 3,000 people yeah. came in and got baptized now with 12 people doing baptism that makes it a little faster right <laughs> it's not like a dmv <laughs> <laughs> yes but here here it is and it's again you know again a um for those that are doing the praxis class a historical jesus critic might say there was baptism happening in early christian communities but maybe Jesus didn't do baptism. Maybe Jesus was baptized, and then Christians just, early Christians just said, hey, let's do baptism, you know. 
Um, that's kind of a cynical way to, to say it. I think maybe a more fair way is to say that Luke is trying to um, join up two traditions. One is it's important in Luke's gospel that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. We're going to start hearing about that on Sunday. So that the baptism began Jesus's ministry. And from that point on, he was the Jesus we know, the healer, the teacher, uh, and then, you know, kind of the prophetic voice that's going to die on the cross. But all of that started with his baptism as, as an adult. And then he's dealing with this reality, too, that is in his community, which is that all the Christians that Luke and his community know we're all baptized as a part of admittance mm -hmm. to the to the community, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and I think Luke is trying to kind of synthesize the two to say what we the first Christian practice we do is we baptize members, mm -hmm. um, and that you know this is still a cause of tension to this day because you know we see it in our church too where we we let people have communion before they're baptized intentionally. Mm -hmm. But technically the Episcopal Church doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what do we do? You know, I basically go, I'm, I'm daring them to file charges against me because you know, <laughs> I think it's more important, blah, blah, blah. But you know, there are other Episcopal churches, I'm no, not, no joking here, but it's probably 50-50 across the land. There are other Episcopal churches that say, you cannot have communion until you're baptized and you need to go through a, you know, a six week class or something. Um, it's, it's definitely something that's going to come to a head soon, probably at the national level in the next couple, you know, so at least the next the decade or so. The, the priest at the individual Episcopal church? It's technically up to the bishop oh, yeah. and the official, uh, but, and the canons of the church. And basically bishops like ours have kind of said, you know, I, I don't, I don't really condone it, but I won't forbid you. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, but learn something new every day, right? I know that in, uh, Greg, I know that like in Methodism and, and John Wesley who came out of the Episcopal Church, it, there's a view of baptism as a means of grace, as uh, as well as, uh, you know, as well as the uh, entry into the, but the, 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 uh, the uh, well, the, the uh, taking of communion in the Eucharist is viewed as a means of grace, as well as a, uh, and just for those that are within the within the body itself. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There's something interesting that Peter says in verse 38. I hadn't really focused in on before, but the crowd asks, what do we do? And before the baptism, he says, change your hearts and your lives. And I think I just love that. Um, because he's speaking to the crowd and he's condemning the crowd in many ways for the death of Jesus. You know, he's conveniently forgetting that he also abandoned Jesus on the, you know, we're going to have to read between the lines that Peter was feeling quite guilty about that still, but he's making it clear again, this is, this is kind of the seeds of all of this. He's saying to the crowds of Jewish people around him, you know, we did this. He's saying you, but he means we, we crucified Christ, you know, and, and we have to deal with that, um, that grave sin that we did but we're not condemned to eternal death because of that decision. Mm -hmm. um, and the baptism is the first step to kind of bring us back mm -hmm. into whole again. And it's, you know, it goes kind of hand in hand with the idea that the whole sacrifice on the cross was to kind of say, you know, you're kind of eternally forgiven um, by God's grace. But I think I love that there is a corrective for the crowd. You know, you can't just get baptized and go back to the way things were. It's mm -hmm. change your hearts and your lives. And then, that's an important point, I think. What other things or questions, anybody? I see a lot of intensive thoughts on the screen. <laughs> I like the way the CEB did uh, translates repent, metanoia, like you were saying, change your hearts and lives, because lots of times we think of repent as being sorry, you know, or something like that, but it's not. It's really metanoia, it has to do with having a, a different mind, a new mind. You know, comes from noia, which is mind, and meta, which is beyond or after. You know, and it talks about it's not just enough to be sorry, but we need to, you know, have a whole new way of looking at things, a whole new perspective on life. Yeah. I, I didn't even realize it's probably repent in other translations. That's yeah. great. Mine is also footnoted with a gazillion passages in Luke and Acts referring to this same thing. So this is going to be. This idea of repenting as changing your hearts and lives is going to come back 
uh, a key sign of turning to God and preparing to receive God's blessing of salvation. And, you know, and this is where we get to that when you are baptized, there's some, there's some kind of vows that are taken, or if you're a child, they're taken on your behalf to repent and return to the Lord, to trust Jesus Christ as your savior. Um, all of those things, which I often am telling families, they're really archaic things, but the whole point of the baptism is initiation into, well, I should say the whole point. The major point of, for us of the baptism is a, a sacramental welcoming into the Christian family. Yeah. Okay. Would anyone like to read chapter three, maybe one to um, one to sixteen? Anyone? Different translation. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. If you want. I can read it out of the NRSV. Great. I got both, so it doesn't matter. But... NRSV. That sounds great. Okay. Chapter three. Okay. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from these, those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him as to John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life from God, raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Wonderful. Leslie, why don't you go on and finish that chapter, if you don't mind. Just a few more verses. Okay. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people, a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. And all the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, also predicted that these days, you are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham and in your descent and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter 
It's, I wonder too if maybe when he was infused with the Holy Spirit, when it you know speaking in tongues, that he kind of got uploaded with a bunch of scriptural references too, because he tends to now know his his Old Testament backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. And I wonder too if it's, this is the origins of Christians starting to just walk around quoting scripture out of context too. <laughs> Although in this case, the context is accurate too. But really, what's your, where you're? I'm joking a little bit. What's really going on is Peter is is again, he's in, he's, this is hermeneutics. He's interpreting what he knows of scripture and seeing it play out before their very eyes. So Moses said in Genesis, the Lord will raise up from your own people, a prophet like me. And Peter's not just saying that's him himself, but that it's, it's that possibility is now amongst you as among all of you new converts to Christianity. Um, and, and yet also a strange kind of scolding of them for not being able to um, accept the miracle that they're able to see. I, I would think if Luke had a, another draft in him of this, he would have Peter be a little bit more shocked of that he can actually do some healing. Um, and here the, he doesn't sound surprised at all. Was yeah. this the first time Peter yeah. uh, in public showed any kind of... That, that's in written form, yes. In, in Luke, and I think in a couple of other Gospels at least, we are, it's mentioned in one sentence that they were sent off by Jesus in pairs, two mm -hmm. by two, mm -hmm. to go and teach and preach and presumably heal um, and do some of those other things in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. But here we get, um, this is the first time we get a, a narrative about it actually happening. Yeah. And so were all the uh, apostles mm -hmm. and able to do miracles? Well, I don't know if I should say or not. We should see how the story oh, plays okay. out. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. But so far, Peter can do it. Yeah, okay. exactly. Good question. You're asking the right questions. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Any other thoughts, anybody? Or questions? Well, right. I have I have something to say that you Good. know that I sometimes say some quote unquote not not weird things, but I saw at that point. I kind of saw this and how much of a, like you said, um, a wow, this must have been for, for, you know, for them to be able to process that, you know, this was what they were heading into. And then I saw, oh, wow, well, that's, that's us, you know, that this is the, um, <laughs> this is the script for for what's to come and that includes us right mm -hmm. that's right absolutely peter is in many ways trying to prepare people for what it means to be a baptized christian as we'd say today a part of your baptismal ministry which is the the work of everyone the laity mm -hmm. um whereas peter himself is also we can only presume going through something internally because He's being set apart from the community. I think the most comparable way we can say is like a bishop mm -hmm. today, basically. And, you know, they'll have basically a version of clergy among them. But um, Peter is really can be thought of as the first uh, bishop, you know, anointed by Christ directly with this task. But Peter is quickly and importantly for the history of Christianity, making a quick pivot to say, by this baptism, you're now empowered on your own to be a part of a part of Christ's life in the world and a part of the spreading of this ministry. Yes, so it is all of us. That's right. But you know, I wonder too for the apostles if this is tinged with a little bit of fear, rightfully so, because yeah. look how it ended for Jesus. Yeah. So do we want to be part of this kind of ministry, right? when the, the state is against us. All right, chapter four. Would anyone like to read a different translation maybe? I'll do it. Oh, thanks, Brendan. What you got? Uh, the message. Great, oh, love it. Uh, four is a little long. Maybe if you could go to, I know it's a little hard to see the numbers on the message, but verse 22. Yeah, that's fine. I'll have right through, great. There's a, there's a break there anyway, so perfect. Oh, good. That's perfect. While Peter and John were addressing the people, the priests, the chief of the temple police, and some Sadducees came up. 
indignant that these upstart apostles were instructing the people and proclaiming that the resurrection from the dead had taken place in Jesus. They arrested them and threw them in jail until morning, for by now it was late in the evening. But many of those who listened had already believed the message, in round numbers about 5,000. The next day was a, me a meeting was called in Jerusalem. The rulers, religious leaders, religion scholars, Annas the chief priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, everybody who was anybody was there. They stood Peter and John in the middle of the room and grilled them. Who put you in charge? What business do you have doing this? With that, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, let loose. Rulers and leaders of the people, if we have been brought to trial today for helping a sick man put under investigation regarding this healing, I'll be completely frank with you. We have nothing to hide. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you killed on a cross, the one God raised from the dead by means of his name, this man stands before you healthy and whole. Jesus is the stone you masons threw out, which is now the cornerstone. Salvation comes no other way. No one name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Only this one. They couldn't take their eyes off them. Peter and John standing there so confident, so sure of themselves. Their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in scripture or formal education. They recognized them as companions of Jesus but the, with the right man before them, seeing him against there so up, seeing him standing there so upright, so healed, what could they say against that? They sent them out of the room so they could work out a plan. They talked it over. What can we do with these men? By now it's known all over town that a miracle has occurred and that they are behind it. There's, there is no way we can refute that. But so that doesn't go any further, let's silence them with threats so they won't dare to use Jesus's name ever again with anyone. <laughs> Called them back and warned them that they were on no account ever again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John spoke right back. Whether it's right in God's eyes to listen to you rather than God, you decide. As for us, there's no question. We can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. The religious leaders renewed their threats, but then released them. They couldn't come up with a charge that would stick, that would keep them in jail. The people wouldn't have stood for it. They were all praising God over what had happened. The man who had been miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Wow. <laughs> I don't know about you, but even hearing this now, and if part of it's the message translation, which is so good, is I, do, I want to stand up and cheer, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. It, feels, it feels, again, it feels cinematic, like, you know, again, it wasn't, it was just in the timeline here, it's only days earlier, you know, to, I mean, well, maybe months at this point, but where Peter ran away and said, I don't know Jesus three times, you know, and the rest of the disciples hid. And this is, this is the John who in John's gospel is, stands at the foot of the cross, but in Luke's gospel, John runs away too. So um, now here they are, now they've been arrested. So, you know, the SHIT is getting real, <laughs> as the kids say. And, and here they are in front of the people who they would consider um, culpable in Jesus's death and could probably do the same thing to them, and yet they're standing guard. I mean, this is like, you see this in when people testify in front of Congress, you know, for on the sake of, I think about all those people, but I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be political, but I really do think of some of the, especially the women who, or the, the Colonel, Alexander Vindman, you know, the ones that testified about two years ago, um, kind of pre-impeachment stuff that, really put themselves out there to just tell the truth and, you know, and lost their jobs because of it. And God knows they probably have um, security now and everything. This is, you can see how people will find what I'm trying to say is people like that will find comfort in these words. You know, I can, I too can be strong like Peter and John. They're only human. You know, th these are not sons of God here. Um, they are just working with the blessing of God in Christ and, 
and the ability to just stand and take it is just so is is great. It's, it's just beautiful. What do you all think? I'm talking too much. I just well, think I these. Go ahead, Leslie, and then Bart. Okay. I just think these people who are, you know, saying, "Okay, whatever you you tell me not to do something," but you know, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We're we can't stop because it's just part of our nature now, you know. Um, so, you know, they they just can they can't they can't stop. They just. But I I can see being a human as a human being how fearful they could be for their own lives, in one aspect. But they also realize that you know that they have been given a mission to perform through through the Holy Spirit through Jesus, and they need to do that. They have to do that. You know, that's, that was what, that's, that was their whole, that's where their whole lives are now. And um, I just, when I just think about all of what's going on with Peter, I think of him as, I never thought of him being a, a learned man where he, 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 where he had known all these scriptures or knew, knew what to say, but supposedly the way the holy spirit is supposed to work in in their lives or supposedly did according to the scripture here that they were able to talk and and recall things or the spirit was giving them the words to say right right rather than them re necessarily recalling it's just the spirit it's just like with with Mo back in the time of moses you know, God said, I will give you the words to say, you know, I'm not going, to, you don't have to remember, you don't have to think about it. I'm going just to do it. And that's, and that's kind of what's happening here. You know, God's using them. And uh, sometimes I always wonder how, how um, we in our, our world now, when we say, oh, God's telling me to say this. And, and a lot of times, I'm not sure how accurate some of these people who say these things are whether that God is actually telling them or they're doing it on their own recognizances saying, okay, I'm going to say this because this is how I think it should be, but not necessarily. Anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> no, well said. And I also think, I, I think Peter is starting to feel a little bit more of a spiritual connection to Moses. Where that, and I, you draw a good parallel of not only is he quoting him, but remember Moses was like, Lord, I can't even speak. You got the wrong guy. And Peter's just like, ah, fisherman. <laughs> you know? And you almost picture him and John, you know, with the getting, you know, getting their finger stamped and getting their citation and leaving. And then John's going like, where did you get up the say all that? And Peter's like, I don't know. It just came out. <laughs> Yeah, what were you going to say, Bob? That was my point. What was your point? Like, yeah. Were they just amazed that, oh my, I can't believe yeah. this word. I can't believe you said mouth. that. I can't believe I said it either. <laughs> you know, really, really fun. All right. Um, but I guess yeah, the right. other thing that it makes me think about, you know, and we hear this time and time again, like God just chose really yes. simple people yes. uh, to spread his word. And I just find that so amazing. He didn't go after the the brightest or the most educated or articulate mm -hmm. he was it was an everyday person so yeah yeah exactly with determination god went to the people that were you know as what we'd say are flawed yeah you know and that's like that's the kind of thing that's like god's purview is like i like things that are you know even if they're not really but feel broken mm -hmm. you know and i like to put things back together well and then it makes it so hopeful for us or I'll talk yeah. to myself for me, who is flawed, that like, oh my gosh. Yeah, you're not flawed. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all are, absolutely. We all are. And I think we're hitting it home. And this is absolutely Luke's message that this could happen to us. And this, and if it was you, you can put your place yourself in the place of Peter and John, you know. Mm -hmm. It's um there there, I think there's a song, a hymn later that says you can preach like Peter and you can sing like Paul or write like Paul, you know, and it's like, I don't know if anybody can write like Paul or preach like Peter, but kind of what Mary, uh, Leslie was saying, you know, through God, all things are possible. It really is. This is the seeds of that belief. Mm -hmm. But there's no time Paul. wasted um, kind of describing his awe at this. He just goes ahead. I mean, maybe he felt all kinds of these things, 
but he didn't get into that. He just kind of, he couldn't help but notice that these things were coming out of his mouth. Right. And, you know, that was his, he just went with it. That's what we were saying. It feels like a, there's a, some deleted scenes missing about him grappling with what had happened. What were you going to say, Diane? I said maybe the common people had more common, right. had more channels open to hear the spirit. Yes. Oh, good point. Exactly. Than, yeah. than those who are articulate and knowledgeable. Right. Well, exactly right. Exactly right. And, you know, it's, this is all intentional because this is many ways acts as the story of how the Christian church started. And, you know, there is no church if it's just bishops and priests hanging around inside, you know. So it's, mm. it's about our role really is to inspire others, you know, to live into the ministry that's given to them, accorded to them. Well, you don't see too many Sadducees or Pharisees or whatever in, in amongst these people these disciples you, you see primarily right. primarily mm. you and me you know um yeah. we're, we're out there you know we're not we're not the the ones on the front line usually you know we're in anyway but so that, that i thought that was that is definitely interesting a good point they don't want to become a, the sadducee they don't want to become the leader of the sanhedrin that's not their goal here their goal is kind of um to dismantle that that oppressive authority, um, and you know, kind of restore it to the people. I'm not saying that this is a populist mm -hmm. <laughs> push whatsoever, but it is to kind of um, undo the corruption um, of the religious leaders in many ways. It occurred to me that the audience for this would be Jews. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and so he sort of sets the stage by saying, "This isn't as new as it seems." Like, look at all these references to yes. to scripture you already know. And right, so it softens the blow a little. It's like this is all stuff you know. Yeah. It's not that new. The way to join us isn't that hard. Yeah. It's clear. You can be baptized, and then he's like, "And it's not as scary as it seems because we can stand up to the religious leaders." Right. Sort of leading. Yeah. It just occurred to me that the way That's the right. audience would have thought it, mm -hmm. like it's not new. It's not hard and it's not quite as scary as you think it is. So, so kind of true. can come along with me. And I, I just, that was a new thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll pair well when Paul comes along later and says, yeah, and you don't need to be circumcised either. And everyone goes, oh, well, this is great. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Well, anyway, well, we know, we know I'm making fun. The Bible spends an inordinate amount of time talking about circumcision, you know. For, for most, um, a mostly male written document, it was a big deal for them. <laughs> All right, so verses 23 till the end of the chapter. Would anyone like to read? Um, anyone at home or anyone here? What you got? You got the women's Bible. Woman. We'll see I, that. Okay. I'll, women's Bible. I'm reading from the. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll shut up. <laughs> After the release, Peter and John returned to the brothers and sisters and reported everything the chief priests and elders had said they listened then lifted their voices in unison to god master you are the one who created the heaven the earth the sea and everything in them you are the one who spoke by the holy spirit through our ancestor david your servant why did the gentiles rage and the prophets plot in vain the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers gathered together as one against the Lord and against his Christ. Indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with Gentiles and Israelites did gather in the city against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and plan had already determined would happen. Now, Lord, Take note of their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with complete confidence. Stretch out your hand to bring healing and enable signs and wonder to be performed through the name of Jesus, your holy servant. After they prayed, the place where they were gathered had, was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking God's word with confidence. The community of believers was one in heart and mind. No, none of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and an abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in care and under the authority of the apostles. 
Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Joseph, whom the apostle nicknamed Barnabas, that is, one who encourages, was a Levite from Cyprus. He owned a field, sold it, bought the money, and placed it in care and under the authority of the apostles. All right. It's a little starting the first bank of Christianity a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> let me uh, let me just say something about to the the to what to make of some of that. You know, it's a common theme in Luke, and we're going to see it in the Gospels on Sundays for the majority of this next year. Um, a common theme in Luke is a, a, a focus and a protection of the poor, um, and I mean financially poor mostly, and, and also a condemnation of the rich. And then we have to be careful because we're not saying that being wealthy isn't a bad thing. It's just a matter of being wealthy to the exclusion of being mindful of the poor is something that is very important to Luke. Now, so therefore you have Jesus saying that, which was already a thing that Jesus said, but Luke just kind of dials it up a lot more, you know, makes it much more pronounced. Here it is again in Acts a little bit, this little bit of business talk here. I, I interpret, this is just my interpretation. I don't have any background on this is to say, I think the line in verse 32, the community of believers were one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. I think that would be something Luke is trying to tell his community. Remember, this is what Christianity was supposed to be. And that maybe already 60 years later, they've gotten away from that. And they do have um, leaders in their communities who are you know, mishandling funds, um, or, or maybe they've lost sight of the fact that they need to be mindful of the poor. Therefore, Luke is kind of, again, you kind of retrofit it back into the story to say there was a time, once upon a time, as Luke likes to say, it came to pass that Christians would actually do good things with their money and their resources. And I think that's kind of a point that's going on through here. Is that if you're wondering where this whole section came from, that's my guess. What do others think or, or about anything else different? David had a phone call, so he's he probably won't be back. Um, no problem. He just um, the only thing I was going to say is I this whole idea of community is so important to Christians because you are to to share with each other everything that you have, and you'll find later in in um, some of the other. Um, chapter somewhere um, some of the some of the some of the times they were asked everybody was supposed to do that and if they held back anything that was not held back what that was not um, it was they didn't give everything they, they would keep back some of the money for themselves and then they got in trouble so um, but this was to me this was very important this is very important to me I because that's one of the things that really bothers me about Christianity nowadays is that we don't do that. And I, we have been more doing that here in this church, just, just through several of the different ministries I've seen where we're, we're able to, to reach out to more to, to people, but we still don't do it. We don't do it as enough as a church per se. Everybody isn't, necessarily pulling every every amount of money you have and giving it to giving it and then she, and then then it being divvied back out to everybody to so everybody has the same amount kind of like what socialism is supposed to be as like like a lot of the uh some of the christian uh, friends of mine who are very very staunch uh, republicans don't want that to happen you know and, but that's my two cents worth <laughs> but you can actually and, read this with a socialist lens, can't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's yeah. kind of it's hard to escape it, you know? Yeah, and I think that, but I think this community effort that we need to, to feel, not just back then, but still in our churches, needs to be brought out. And because there are just so many people out there that, that are in need, that are poor, that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I have to tell you with inflation and the way things are, People just can't afford to do things like right. they, even back in the 60s and 70s, you could afford to do a lot more than you do now where we just, you know, it's like, where's the money going to come from for, for this or for that? Or, 
whatever. It's just it's it's just hard. But I think, um, right, Leslie. I think you're right. And you know, one person's poverty comes from someone else's extreme wealth. I really I really think that. And it's just it's just a situation. We I mean, it's as old as time, unfortunately. But yeah. Luke here gives a little ca caution at, from Luke's perspective at the end of the first century to say, please, please remember what Jesus stood for. You know, it, let, let's not lose the charity that's that's important of, of all of this. Um, it's it's very hard, very hard. Yep. We also get introduced to Joseph, who would be called Barnabas, a Saint Barnabas, and. Um, we're starting to get introduced to some of these, um, this outer ring of people. I think I described last time, think of the Target logo. So you've got Jesus in the center. The next ring is the disciples who lived and breathed and ate dinner with him, minus Judas. And then we get, starting with Matthias, we get the next ring of people, which are people that didn't know Jesus while he was alive, but are completely committed to this work of um, the early Christianity. And Barnabas is one, and many more are coming through, including one of the all-time greats, St. Stephen. Um, and we're going to meet them in the next two chapters. It's going to get really exciting here. And we're going to be introduced next week to Saul of Tarsus. So, Greg, I, um, yes, Greg, so, um, I have the, uh, the message here. And when it talks about um, uh, what Barnabas which means son of comfort. Now, when mm. Barb read it from her Bible, Barb, do you know what yours um, said? It gave a description, but it did not say son of comfort. It said the one who encourages. The one who encourages. You're right. That's very different. Mm -hmm. It is very different. So where does that come from? Barnabas consistently, in the footnotes of ours, Barb and I have the same yeah, Bible. Yeah. Barnabas consistently lives up to his name as one who encourages. Yeah, I'd have to look. Um, well, we could use David right now. He probably knows off the top of his head. But um, probably there's a, word, there's a word in there that is, and then it's a Greek word, because this would have been written in Greek. So okay. I will um, make a notes, and I will look it up, and I will, top of the class next week, I will bring it, I promise. Okay, because that was real confusing for me. What that word is and how else it's used in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, one a lot of yeah, a lot of times that as is in the Greek, it's an idea versus a an actual translation. So you have to be really watch what you're looking at because because we want to say we want to do like we translate from French to English word for word. This is how it is, or Latin to mm -hmm. to whatever. But you can't do that in with the old with with Hebrew especially but even with the that we even with the Greek that a lot of the a lot of there's nuances out there that just so many different and I and I and I'm not David so I'm sure he <laughs> will have some other other ideas about that and and I will mention it to him but he um but, but I'm sure that that's what it is because the word encourages could also mean could also mean comfort you know, because because when you're comforting somebody, you're encouraging that person also to. Uh, okay. So Google says it's a Greek form of an Aramaic name. Oh, OK. And they think the original Aramaic is bar Navia, which is son of the prophet. But in Acts, they, in, they interpret that to mean encouragement or comfort. Oh. Son of the prophet and the prophets bringing you. Comfort yeah, so. Or encouragement. So, you know. In, Bar in Hebrew or Aramaic means son. So like bar mitzvah, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they're referred to by their father. So Peter bar Joseph, I think is Peter's, Simon Peter bar Joseph or something like. Um, so yeah, bar Nabas means son of Nabas and Nabas means, what you said, yeah. Yep. Which I forgot. I have the Aramaic letters. <laughs> there you go, yes, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's hard. This, they're speaking Aramaic at the time. That was the language they spoke. That was their common language. But they read in, in Hebrew in, temp, in the temple. Mm -hmm. And everything that was written that was, you know, intelligent writing was in Greek <laughs> because of the Greek Greco-Roman influence, you know. And they, we hadn't even gotten to making Latin the, la you know, the, the language of the land. That comes later. So you get all these translations, and then you get stuck with poor English, which, as you know, is just 
the strangest language coming in from all the others. It really is. Um, and, and with English, we try to pick one word that means one thing. And that's not often how the Bible was composed. Um, it was there, like Leslie beautifully said, it's, sometimes a word means an idea, not necessarily an active verb, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. Thanks, everyone. It was a good week. And we'll be back next Wednesday at 1030 in person or online. All right. See ya. Take care. Bye.